Um, and and nothing. It's not that that uh, you have to be overly concerned, but I think it, it's uh, it's something where a lot of times people that that haven't traveled the world or been to other places, it's it's hard to be aware of the fact that things are not the same um, in other countries as they are in your own. And and because Baja is so accessible, you can drive across the border and you truly are in, in a different country with different cultures, customs, and laws. And uh, it's it's important to remind people that, that those things exist. So not to go too far into the whole safety thing. Um, and then I, I, I could go on for hours with you about uh, the uh, escapades with the uh, Carrera Baja Americana, but uh, did I get it right that time? Hey, How about you got that? it right. Very good. But um, Very I think good. the other, the flip side to this, Jim, is just the the interesting um, element of you are uh, heavily involved in uh, uh, professional motorsports at a very high level, and um, it's fascinating that you that you choose go dr- going to drive um, more or less a jalopy in in Baja as a form of recreation. So let's dive just a little bit into. Um, what you do for a living and how you got there. And I know that there's one interesting part of it that uh, um, you, you were working quite closely with Patrick Dempsey at some point in, in your career. Just give us a, a kind of a brief synopsis of some of the different things you've been involved with in the motorsports world. Yeah, sure. Well, I had a, a long 26 uh, year career with Mods in North America. And, and within that career was uh, one of the people that started Uh, all the Mazda ladder programs. So the Mazda road to Indy and all that was uh, one of my projects at work. Um, Within that um, met up with uh, some buddies of mine that were working at the Panos racing school, uh, put together a program um, for Patrick Dempsey. So Patrick uh, had done fairly well in their school and doing some other things, racing. Hey, you know what? Um, I think it's, I think we probably, uh, (laughs) sorry, Patrick, but, it might help. We have to tell who Patrick Dempsey is. I mean, I, he, he's a lot of people know who he is, but I, I'll confess. And again, sorry, Patrick. Yep. <laughs> when I first started hearing that Patrick yeah. Dempsey was coming on wide open trips, I didn't know who Patrick Dempsey was. So Patrick Dempsey is a movie right. star. Let's get that out of, out of the way. And then also um, the television show. What was it? Grey's Anatomy. So Grey's Anatomy. Celebrity. So, and that, that was uh, an actor. Yeah, he was. Yeah, he's a celebrity actor. He's one of these guys that had a very. Uh, a uh, very great career early on, and then he went through a dry spell, and then he he did, uh, you know, uh, was starting to come back and do well in movies like uh, Sweet Home Alabama and and uh, some movies like that. But then he was cast as uh, as a doctor on the TV show Grey's yeah, Anatomy, right. where he was on for nine years, and he leveraged uh, leveraged that. Uh, that participation into just a, you know, a great career for himself. And during that time, he discovered he had always loved racing. His father loved racing. Um, and he was finally to the point financially. Um, and his wife, Jill actually is the one that gave him a skip barber racing school certificate. And he did that and loved that and started going to driver schools and working on his craft. So he got to the point where, um, he was good enough that uh, he was ready to make the uh, the jump to more professional racing, and and I just had this kind of unique job within the marketing department of Mazda North America, where uh, motorsports marketing was a responsibility. Um, but I was also just very much involved in uh, promotions and events, and was in the marketing department. So uh, we crafted a deal so Patrick uh, could take the next step up in racing. And Mazda, he did voiceover work for the Mazda ads, and we paid him with race cars and race car parts and that sort of thing. It was there a, you a go very behind the scenes look fun. at uh, the, the, the scenes. automotive yeah, exactly. uh, motorsports world of sponsorship <laughs> and deal making. Did he ever say Zoom Zoom? Exactly. Um, no, he, <laughs> that was a uh, that was a little kid who said Zoom Zoom, but he he did you know. He, he would be reading the copy about how fantastic all yeah, the vehicles yeah. were. So, um, but um, um, anyway, so I, we became friends during that period. I knew the guys on the race team. I, I actually worked for the race team, was very involved in a document documentary they did, which was uh, Patrick Dempsey racing Lamar. So if anyone ever sees that, I have a pretty, pretty, pretty significant role within that. And that's uh 
you know, got to learn the documentary world and media world and all that sort of thing too. So um, he and I became, uh, you know, pretty good friends there. And, and I, uh, I was actually the last remaining employee of Dempsey racing. He ended up, um, um, uh, you know, racing tends to be a very challenging uh, uh, vocation or avocation for, for people and especially the people around him and finally reached a decision that his kids needed him more than he needed yeah, the racetrack. You know, I've said uh, about he, racing for quite a, quite a few years now after becoming a father. Um, racing is an incredibly yep, selfish, yep. selfish sport. Unless you're being paid and that is how you are putting food mm-hmm. on the table, racing is a very selfish yep. sport or hobby yes, or, absolutely. So he... or whatever else you want to call it. <laughs> Yeah, and, and so I managed his exit from racing, um, and I mean he's still very involved. He's uh, uh, he's at Le Mans this weekend. Um, I had the fun thing yesterday. I could hear him doing an interview on the radio, and I started texting him, and I could tell I distracted him because all of a sudden he started stumbling in the middle and giggled a little, and I got a a very funny text from him once the interview was over. Uh, that's kind of a fun little thing that's been done to me a few times. So you're um, currently, so, though, uh, what are, what are you ahead. currently doing now? That that was uh, back yeah, in, in... Sure. That was up, correct. I and exited that in 20, well, early 2016. His last time racing at Le Mans was 2015, where he finished on the podium. We got a second-place finish. Um, and, uh, so then at, right after that, he basically said, look, I, my family needs me. Um, I'm going to stop racing. Um, but we had, re- we had relationships with Porsche, with Tag Heuer watches, um, a few other companies, and, uh, we had just done such a good job and he is such a sincerely nice guy that we managed to maintain all those relationships. So he's still an ambassador for Porsche. Uh, still has a relationship with Tag Heuer. So I basically worked myself out of a job that helped him transition back to being a uh, a father and a husband. And, you know, in some ways, I'm extremely proud of helping him navigate those waters. So uh, that year he exited Grey's Anatomy. Uh, he was struggling with the family. Um, but by the end of uh, by the end of the year, he uh, he was moving on with his own production company uh, shifting gears production. We're going to see a, a big movie of his come out. Oh, that's right. Uh, and, uh, now it's been, yeah, the art of racing right. the rain is coming out. And, um, um, so he moved into production work and again, we managed to maintain all those partnerships with companies like Porsche Very and cool. Tag Heuer. So, uh, and, and I mean, it was, it was a great adventure I had after leaving Mazda. Um, I was honestly ready for a, a new challenge by the time that happened though. Um, and so I, I'm working for a company that uh, is now uh, it's SRO, which is Stefan Rattel organization, and we are the the uh, basically the biggest GT racing organization in the world. I mean, we have race series all over the world, and I just uh, I'm series manager for the touring car class here in uh, North America. So uh, managed to take a career, a very corporate career, for a long time, and. Uh, now I've been with SRO America. First, it used to be called Pirelli World Challenge. Then Stefan Rattel bought us out, and uh, so we're now SRO, part of the SRO organization. So we've we've kind of gone uh, full circle all the way into motorsports, and, and now I'm going to steer us back to Baja, and, and we're going to do that through the Good. Patrick Dempsey thread, which is Good. a gentleman who did Good. spend a bit of time down in Baja um, with me and with you when you were down there um, during the Baja 1000 yep. a couple of times, I believe. Yeah. Um, yeah. He ran Baja challenge I think, two or three times and he absolutely, he loves the thousand. He just, again, he absolutely loves the event. So that, then that may be an event at some point. Um, uh, you know, he, he may, he may try again. I, I, I think he would love to keep the door open. Um, he doesn't want to invest the time like he did, uh, when he was, when we were running the world endurance championship, um, but I know he misses a little bit of the seed. And now his sons are getting old enough that that may be something that they have interest in. And uh, so who knows? So here, here's the, the interesting thing that I think um, there are stories. And, and uh, I mean, Sammy Hagar, we could go on and on and on. People of um, uh, with financial freedom, people with uh, – uh, time on their hands, people with uh, power and influence um, 
all these these uh, things that that the average person thinks that they want. I find it, or or a status they wish they could achieve. I find it interesting that that lots of those people choose to go to Baja, and the beautiful thing is that you don't need any of those things that you think you want. That these people that then choose to go to Baja, you don't have to have any of that to go to Baja. You can walk across if you have to. Um, you can ride the bus once you're there. You can drive across, you can fly, but but it's right there for anybody and everybody. And I think it's so interesting how so often we hear about celebrities that are choosing to spend time somewhere in Baja. Some of it is is um, um, at a uh, uh, glitz and glamour and, and um, very non-rugged Baja, but there's a lot of people um, – of fame and fortune that choose to go off into the rugged, uh, remote, desolate areas and, and spend time in those areas. And I, I'm fascinated by that. And then also feel so lucky that um, I was born into uh, a family and an environment and, and a situation where Baja has always been a part of my life. I didn't have to choose to go um, and, and make it be a part of my life. It's always been a part of my life. The great thing about Baja is Uh, at least for me, the serenity that you could find there. So uh, you'll be in places where, you know, there's no cell phone. Um, You know, you're definitely in a little bit of a rugged area where you need to be careful in lots of different ways. Um, But you turn a corner and just as expansive view and, and um, it's just such an amazing piece of ground. How, you know, desolate, I think sounds too negative, um, but just the, the vast wide open spaces are just, you know, so absolutely beautiful. And I think, I think for people like Patrick, um, it's truly a place where they get away. Um, um, you know, I used to joke, uh, and I'll give Tag Hoyer a plug here. When, when, when we were a, a racing team, you know, uh, uh, with affiliated with Porsche, I used to joke, we have three time zones. Okay. The Porsche time zone is you're always 10 minutes early. The Tag Heuer time zone is to the millisecond on time. And then the Hollywood time zone is whenever. <laughs> I mean, you know, you, you couldn't predict at all. So with Baja, I think it's just you get away from all that. Uh, Baja has almost got its own time. And and my brother Joe, jokingly, we call it, we call it uh, uh, Baja Midnight. And Baja Midnight is when it's dark and it's quiet. And if you're tired, you just go to bed. But if you want to stay up, you just stay up. You know, Baja Midnight could be 9 o'clock one night and 2 a.m. the next night. And it's respectable to be Um, awake during Baja Midnight, and it's also respectable to be asleep during Baja Midnight. You know, to survive well, you need common sense and good judgment. There's something just great about that, though, especially in a world where we're overprotected and, and, uh, um, you know, and, and again, it's not that it's dangerous. You could find danger if you want it. Um, but you could also just have the best experience of your life there. Well, listen, Jim, it's been a pleasure chatting with you. I, I uh, am encouraging you to continue on in um, whether you're in the planning phases of another event down there or it's already happening and you're just not sharing it with the entire world. And again, this is all kind of in, <laughs> in fun here. But uh, I love hearing the stories yeah. about you and your family. Yeah, we'll make sure that uh, we'll make sure you know the next one, so you'll be on the invite list. And uh, my my next Baja adventure, I know I'm taking, will be uh, for the Baja 1000 because um, that that is just absolutely such a, an amazing, fantastic event. And I usually I know enough people I could always get someone who needs a hand. Uh, and so I always do chase with somebody there. And so I'll try to, I'll try to find a a small team that needs somebody that uh, knows how to turn a wrench or knows how to solve a problem and, and, uh, just enjoy the thousand because the, the, the the Baja 1000 is, uh, again, just an amazing, you know, Jim, that actually, I'll be there for that. That's a good thing to bring up here, right? As we wind this down, um, you know, we, we, sure. Like like I mention often on this podcast, we are are not uh, specifically steering towards or really away from from racing. And it is part of my life, and so it's it, to to completely avoid it, it would not be um, would not be authentic. Um, but we've really never talked about um, you know. There's people that are listening to this podcast that are interested in Baja, and like it or not, the Baja 1000 in today's life is part of the Baja culture. 
and lots of people do like it. And so if you do find yourself interested in it but know nothing about um, 